I'm Dean Perrine, and on behalf of JSA, thank you for tuning in to our Greener Data Virtual Roundtable. Today, I'm joined by a range of specialists in the data center industry who are featured contributors to our upcoming book, Greener Data Volume 2, that will launch on Earth Day 2024. Today, the group will talk about an important topic featured in the book, building the business case, unlocking <clears throat> excuse me, unlocking the social and financial benefits of going green. We'll begin by going around the virtual table for some quick introductions. Panelists, let us know a little bit about your role, a quick snapshot of your organization, and why the topic is so meaningful to you. Michael, we'll let you kick it off. Thanks, Dean. My name is Michael Boron. I am a broker and associate vice president at Cushman and Wakefield. We are a global real estate services company and I work within the Global Data Center Advisor Group. Uh, it's a global group of real estate and data center professionals focused on servicing the data center industry. My team mostly works on large site selection projects, capital markets and consulting services uh, for both operators and uh, tenants and end users. Excellent, thank you, Michael. Raymond? Yeah, Raymond Burrell, uh, Senior Sales Executive for Ecosense. We're based out of Nottingham, um, and I am responsible for the Americas from the sales side of things. And we are focused on thermal optimization as well as capacity planning for mission critical end users, data center owners, and operators. Um, yeah, looking forward to this uh, chat. Excellent. Thank you, Jason. Pete, I'm sorry, Raymond. Jason, you're next. <laughs> Thanks, Dean. Uh, Jason Carlin with Flexential. I'm the Chief Innovation Officer, uh, which means I get to do a bunch of fun things. Um, and uh, you know, Flexential, if you don't know anything about that, is a data center operator, builder, provider with uh, a range of uh, cloud managed services and interconnect products really focused in the United States, uh, 19 markets, 41 data centers across the U.S. Excellent, Jason. Pete, now you. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. Hi, uh, Pete Nesbitt, Managing Partner at Eden7. We're part of the Cambridge Management Consulting Group of Businesses. Um, principally, we are we are a consultancy business that helps organisations decarbonise and helps them with the strategy and really drive change into their organisations and um, you know, across a number of different industries, but with particular interest into the data centre industry and making sure that organisations are aligned to their customers' needs and making sure that their, their sustainability strategies and their sustainability plans uh, really do deliver for their uh, for their client base as well. Very good. Thank you, Pete and Francois. Hi, I'm Francois Sterin. So I'm a Chief Operating Officer at uh, data for group um, data for group is a, a leading location provider in Europe with presence in uh, Paris, uh, uh, Frankfurt, uh, Madrid, Milan, um, and Warsaw, five markets. Uh, and clearly, I've always been uh, involved in uh, um, uh, uh, sustainability over the, la the last 20 years of working in data centers. And I'm a big proponent of uh, why, you know, green make business sense. And I'll explain a little bit more. So. Excellent. Thank you so much, Francois. <clears throat> and thank you to all the speakers. So let's go ahead and jump right in. Innovative thinkers in the business community are coming to view sustainability activities in terms of market opportunity and value creation. The twin ECOs, economic and environmental progress, are no longer seen as competing, but rather as complementary forces. With that, question number one. In the data center context, what is some of the low hanging fruit in terms of aligning financial and sustainability benefits? Francois, we will go ahead and kick this one off with you. Yeah, there's, there's many uh, low hanging fruits still. Uh, we think we are already uh, good on that, but there's actually many, many things we can do. We, I'm not going to talk about PUE, power usage efficiency, that much, but I think there's still very simple thing we can still do where uh, you would both save money and uh, be good for the planet. Let's say, for instance, in the uh, uh, data rooms, you increase temperature a little bit from, uh, with the latest recommendation from ASHRAE. It doesn't change anything really on operation. It doesn't cost anything. And then you improve your PUE right there, and it's good. Uh, you consume less electricity, and it's better. Using renewable energy also is, is still a, a lot of people already do it, but it needs to be a, a, even more mainstream. Uh, now in many jurisdictions, renewable energy is cheaper than conventional energy. So again, you save money and you are good on uh, the environmental front. So 
you you talked about the two echoes, economy and, and ecology. Uh, I mean, clearly, uh, they're, they're aligned in the data center industry. So, uh, and there's still many, uh, there are still many uh, areas where you can uh, optimize, like I just said. Very good. Jason, your thoughts? Sure, I agree a bunch with, with uh, Francois. For us, I think it starts really very much at the design phase, really before even building. So site selection and being able to change um, the design based on the environmental conditions of, of the region that we're in. For example, what we do in Oregon is quite different than what we do in Denver versus, you know, versus what we do in Atlanta. So it really starts at kind of the baseline at the design level of understanding what the environmental conditions are um, within those regions and being able to customize you know, for that, and then to uh, also just be focused on helping our customers understand how they're using, you know, energy. Um, we have a ton of data just on power utilization and, and, you know, how it's being used on our customer base and being able to help them understand kind of their thermal dynamics and what's going on. Um, ASHRAE, you know, the Delta T temperatures have changed a lot. It's kind of funny these days to have a customer come into your data center and, and say it feels hot, um, you know, versus what everybody was very familiar with, you know, 10, 20 years ago where it was very chilly. So things have changed a lot. There's, I think, things that we learn every single day. Liquid cooling is another area that um, can be much more efficient from the thermal you know, load perspective. It's maybe more complicated from a, um, you know, a lack of standards and things like that, but a uh, very interesting space to be in and very important for us to, to look at our impact on the climate and our communities. Thank you, Jason. Raymond? Yeah, no, I think I'm going to echo slightly a little bit of what Jason and Francois are saying. I think energy efficiencies and optimization from an energy standpoint is the easiest, lowest hanging fruit uh, right now when it comes to the fact that we're very busy building hyperscale data centers. Obviously, there's a huge draw from AI and other uh, apps that run that require a lot of compute, but we're really missing the boat on the stranded capacity that's already out there thermally and from an IT perspective. So I think, you know, before we get too far down the road with large capital projects, let's make sure we're using what we already have built the, the most efficient way possible, right? So optimizing that space, returning that cooling capacity back to you so you can then increase compute before you decide where you need to build or how you need to expand um, is probably gonna be the lowest hanging fruit. Obviously, selfishly, that's what our software really excels at is the optimization thermally but it is frankly the lowest hanging fruit right now is let's just make sure we're doing the right things with the energy we already are consuming. Very good point, Raymond. Thank you. Pete, your thoughts? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, around the cost side of things, it's clear, you know, those optimizations aside is uh, hugely important. And, uh, you know, if you can save, save on consumption, then that's a fantastic thing. I think maybe looking at it from the other side and revenue generating. Um, so making sure your message is strong to your customers. I think there's sometimes a quite mixed message on 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 the strategy that's being delivered and how it's articulated to the client and how it's aligned to the client as well. And sometimes it gets very much caught into the technical detail of it, but actually really making sure that it can speak to the customer is quite important. So maybe maybe that's more of a revenue generating opportunity rather than a cost saving opportunity. But clearly, the cost saving is hugely important. I think some folks agree with you. I'm seeing a lot of thumbs up coming from uh, from the uh, the listeners right now. Michael, final thoughts on the question? Uh, I'm going to echo uh, most of what's already been said, but coming at this from a sustainability uh, perspective for site selection, low hanging fruit is always locating within a market that already has access to uh, green power. Uh, the closer to 100 percent, the better. Um, challenges are that a lot of those markets are seeing longer timelines to connect. But even with that, uh, we're, we're seeing groups uh, look at sites with longer and longer timelines with the intention of securing that power. Uh, and I mean, it, we really are seeing it impact investment decisions between markets. So, I mean, if you have all things being equal between two markets, but one has a cleaner grid, the cleaner grid is going to win most of the time. Um, very, very good point. Um, question number two, what new thinking will help position sustainability as a strategic business goal? The question again is, what new thinking will help position sustainability as a strategic business goal? And Michael, we're gonna stick with you on this one first. Yeah, I'm of the mind just working with our tenants. That, uh, it, these decisions are largely gonna be driven by end users as well as uh, regulation within market. Uh, 
I mean, on our end user side, we're doing quite a bit of RFPs and RFIs out to data center operators within market. Uh, we have dozens of questions that rank providers based on their sustainability. Uh, and it does materially impact what our recommendations are. Uh, while cost is important right now with the overall uh, economy, uh, we're seeing more and more weight get placed on those sustainability metrics over time. And they are they are seen as a risk over the life of, uh, of, of a lease. So uh, if you're approaching it from the tenant's perspective, they're, they're trying to look at and assess a site beyond just even what the initial term of the lease is. So they're looking at the site five to 10 years, what potential regulations are coming down the pipeline? Will that affect this site? Uh, how will that affect my total cost of operation? It's, it's a very expensive task to have to move those deployments into uh, new facilities. So it, it's something that we're seeing more and more of. It goes beyond the initial financial terms of the deal. And I, I mean, because of that, operators have to look at this. I mean, we're already seeing it in most markets in North America and Europe, newer, more efficient data centers and greener markets tend to have lower vacancy rates than um, older facilities uh, that are less efficient. Um, you can go into most markets in North America and, and you'll find that to be the case. Pretty good, Michael. Thank you. Pete, your turn. Yeah, I think that uh, we see it across a number of different industries, not just the data center side of things, but around the collaboration is talked quite a lot. Innovation is really important. So if we're thinking about what new things are being done, I think organizations are coming together and it might be competitors competitive, but maybe not so much, but you know, within the same supply chain of a major customer, that, that, that is something that is talked about quite a lot and um, innovation forums around that. Um, also um, introducing and it isn't consistent across every every business case that's ever been put together, but introducing yeah. carbon pricing into business cases. So really starting to get get the business cases moving on the back of the environmental side of things. Now, you know, all business cases have to stand up on their own on their own feet from a from a financial point of view. But sometimes they do get pushed back um, in the in the short term because they um, they may not stand up to something that needs to be delivered in the next uh, six months. So. I think we're seeing that more and more, and it comes in different flavors, to be fair, especially if you're a global business and how you keep consistency around carbon pricing, but that may well be an element that starts to come into uh, a lot of organizations thinking. Excellent, Pete, thank you. Um, Jason, what new thinking will help position sustainability as a strategic business goal? Yeah, we talked a bit about data, you know, and since it's interesting right now, just the impact of AI on our, on our industry, I think I saw a stat um, yesterday that NVIDIA shipped 900 tons of H100 GPUs last quarter. Um, you know, they require a ton of, of power and space and cooling to go make that happen. And uh, don't see that slowing down anytime soon, which really means, you know, the impact of AI just from a consumption basis uh, in the data center space is, is massive. But I think the opportunity to take AI and, and sort of apply it against, uh, you know, some of the challenges that we're having and we're talking about here is also you know quite substantial um and so i think you know being able to to use the utilization data power data consumption data and, and start to automate you know ways to to be you know more sustainable and more uh, cost effective and, and efficient is um is the right way we've got a customer that is a is a massive SaaS customer that um, uses automation to really change their Workload dynamics, you know, from a power consumption and cooling consumption capacity, you know, on demand without any human interaction all year long, based on their seasonal dynamics and what their, you know, use cases might be during tax time or during the holidays or whatever it might be. So I think there's really some great, you know, technological advances that um, are just right around the corner with uh, the uh, improvements around AI, the accessibility, and, and IoT. Very good, Jason. Thank you, Raymond. Yeah, you know, I think there've been some good answers so far. I'm gonna take a slightly different tact. Um, I believe that from the beginning of sustainability when LEED was brought out originally and we started to think about, you know, how do we be more sustainable when it comes to infrastructure? Um, I believe life cycle costs need to be prioritized over first costs. So the first cost mentality right now is driving a lot of monthly, quarterly and annual decisions from all businesses. And sustainability really drives home the value uh, in a life cycle perspective. So if you can envision that iceberg showing the tip of the iceberg outside of the water, 
the bulk of the costs are life cycle costs are underneath the water. And that's where you can crash and run into that. And it can cause major issues for you later in your, your business's future for not having those costs under control. So I think if we move to a life cycle perspective when making these types of decisions sustainably, then obviously green wins every single day of the week. You know, there's never going to be a scenario where you're going to regret all the trees that you saved or the amount of energy and the carbon emissions that you've reduced uh, five, 10, 15 uh, years down the road, especially if you start to brand and associate your brand with this investment. So maybe construction costs go up 10 percent, but then you're seeing uh, a realizing a savings over many years later, uh, it, it 50, 60 percent. Um, right. So at the end of the day, I think having the courage to spend a little more upfront to design and build and manage and operate sustainably is going to deliver all the end uh, results on the back end when it comes to your brand, your partnerships and the growth of your business, the stable cost structure. So, you know, if not even improving that by having these uh, efficient technologies. So I'm thinking, you know, that's where the shift needs to happen, right? We need to uh, stop watching the stock ticker and start thinking about our long-term impact, right? Of our decisions. Uh, I think some of our uh, our viewers agree with you based on the, uh, the heart emojis and uh, thumbs up coming coming around. But uh, Francois, your your the final thoughts on the question. Yeah, and and, and your question is around what new thinking. I, I, I would answer actually what new context uh, will uh, position sustainability as strategic uh, even more than it was before. I think the context is. I think Jason mentioned a little bit about it. Is like the acceleration of demand with the AI coming in. We're seeing every single day an announcement, uh, uh, and we did ours this weekend of like billions of financing to build new data centers, gigawatts, and super massive uh, uh, facilities. And the thing is, data center used to be the super desired investment. So communities were doing all what they had to do to attract investment. I think now I'm seeing the reverse happening. It's like now data center needs to convince community to welcome this uh, uh, huge facility. And there is a, 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 an increasing challenge of acceptability of the data center, like uh, community accepting to actually host those data centers. And how do they accept? They accept if you're sustainable. So my, uh, my bottom line is like sustainability is period like uh, your license to operate if we want to continue to grow as an industry. Uh, we have no choice but actually to be sustainable. It's not just financial. We discuss about the financial uh, aspect of it, but it's a financial from an aspect of if you want to continue to grow and to serve your customers, has to be sustainable. Uh, in, and not just like using uh, renewable energy being uh, uh, energy efficient, but also look at more dimension of sustainability, like use of resources. Water is an increasing uh, area of attention. Uh, biodiversity, land usage. In Europe, land usage is a big deal. Uh, and so reusing existing building rather than building a uh, greenfield, for instance. And so all those things um, are by default strategic, right? And they're, you know, right there, like a front and center of any uh, uh, decision. And so clearly for me, um, the era is now you, you have no there. It's a good thing, right? You have to be uh, uh, have a sustainable credential uh, 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 very, uh, very well established. Otherwise, you're not just going to be able to build. Full stop. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Francois. And uh, great, great answers, gentlemen. Um, I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next question. Sustainability risk management, SRM, is a growing field that aims to balance potential to balance potential to balance the potential to address ESG risk against a business's profit objectives. How are, is your business working to address sustainability risk and what principles guide your mitigation strategies? I love this question. I'm sorry that I butchered asking it, but uh, Jason, let's go ahead and start with you. Sure. We uh, we just published our first ESG report um, this year for 2022, but have had a very strong ESG program for the last probably you know three or four years um, specifically. I run our customer advisory council as well, so I get to engage with a lot of our big clients to understand you know where their heads are are at in terms of of climate and sustainability initiatives. And I I will definitely say it's um, you know it is top of mind. We're actually holding a, another workshop here 
in a month to understand you know changing requirements and changing needs that they have um, as you you may know the sec has a, a a new climate reporting standard that is hitting public companies here in in 2024 so making sure that they can at least report out their um, energy you know consumption and, and sort of clean energy capabilities um, is super important to them uh, you know, we've been part of, of the science-based, uh, uh, SBTI science-based uh, uh, initiatives, uh, as well as iMason's Climate uh, Accord, you know, it's really trying to set standards and understand standards. Um, Francois mentioned PUE, it still seems like it's the lowest common denominator that most of us can get our heads around, but it's, it's got to go beyond that to being able to, you know, really provide, you know, almost a, a, a blockchain of electrons and where they're coming from and where they're going to, to really track, um, you know, the, the usage and, and really being able to prove to our customers where power comes from. I've spent way, way more time, uh, and I'm a technology guy, talking to power companies in the last, you know, couple of years than I thought I ever would. And it's um, the whole supply chain of, of, you know, transmission and generation and, you know, where their uh, renewables and, and, you know, low emission or no emission um, capabilities are coming from. And, you know, they've been sort of dealing with the supply chain issues just like anybody else. Which is why we have you know conditions in California and Virginia and others where it's just impossible to even you know get power from a traditional energy source. So um, lots of dynamics and really you know spending more and more time as a company uh, and I would say as an industry understanding what those dynamics are and uh, planning for the future and, and getting ahead of it. Very good, thank you, Jason. Michael, your thoughts? Yeah, so. Uh... We're approaching this from from both the operator and the and the tenant perspective. But on on the operator side for site selection, uh, we're trying to get ahead of what our clients are looking for. Um, they are looking for sustainable uh, sustainable developments and, and platforms to to grow. Uh, the scale has never been bigger, so it's also probably the most challenging time uh, to find those solutions. Uh, but we're we're getting ahead. We're finding sites where we believe you could build a platform for one of the most sustainable data centers uh, in the world in multiple markets, um, but the timelines are often challenging for them, right? You have to work with the community, you have to work with municipalities, local governments, you have to um, find partnerships. I mean, you've, you find that a lot with uh, especially trying to, trying to fit data centers into, for example, district energy systems, right? The, in North America, we don't have quite as robust a, um, a platform of district energy systems as uh, maybe Europe, uh, but it's getting there. There's a lot of interest. And quite frankly, there's a lot of value in that waste heat and reusing it for other uses. Uh, but it does take time to put those partnerships together. So we're trying to get ahead and, and put those programs uh, in place for our clients ahead of time. Uh, and that ties back into what I was saying, in RFIs and RFPs for uh, our end user tenants as well. I mean, they see this as a risk. Um, the data center is, it's been a lofty industry and there's been a lot of growth, but at the same time, like there are groups that have been left in the wayside. There's been some bankruptcies over the last few years. So uh, like our tenants, we're educating our clients uh, of the financial health of the operators that are providing their services, as well as the sustainability metrics um, that are being reported on because these are seen as long-term risks. If you wait for the regulations to kick in and all of a sudden big capital costs are required uh, to stay competitive or stay within a regulation, what does that mean for the operator? Does that mean it goes into a separate fund and it's going to get sold? Like these, these are all questions that end users and tenants are looking at when assessing sites. And again, it goes beyond the initial term of the service agreement or the lease. Um, they're looking, they're trying to look, 10, 15 years and beyond uh, what's going to happen. So really getting ahead of these trends, I think, is um, it, it is how we're trying to help our clients um, mitigate these risks. Excellent. Thank you very much, Michael. Pete, how is your organization working to address sustainability risk and what principles guide your mitigation strategies? Well, um, I mean, I think, I think the... Uh, the important thing about this is it's about making sure that you've got strong governance in place um, and that organization, I mean, it's always kind of been there for uh, for organizations over time. 
and it will really kind of drive them drive them forward and make them a more agile business as they as they move forward so i think getting as much information as you can and really kind of thinking about your landscape is uh, is, is is really important so i think the the organizations really need to kind of think about that and they need to really think about how they're positioning themselves and also position themselves against their customers' needs and kind of reduce the volatility to their customers as well. So we've seen that with the uh, energy crisis that we've had in Europe recently, um, where prices have been very high. And I think well, that, that from a business point of view, both from a risk and an alignment to the customer's needs is, is crucial. So organizations can make sure that they are aligned to, uh, to give their customers less volatility around that, around that and also allow them to have the uh, the relevant kind of security of supply as well. So all of those risks are really nicely aligned to meeting what the customers are looking for in the future. And um, and I think that aligns to also the customer's kind of net zero uh, aspirations as well. Very good, thank you, Pete. Francois, your thoughts? Yeah, so on, on the how, is it the risk management or an opportunity management? I mean, we can debate for a long time, but uh, we take it more from a positive side that with uh, the way we've organized is uh, we call the data for good program where we have several stream with the environment side of thing. It's a, it's a fairly uh, standard CSR program with like also the social responsibility and, and the committee. Um, but um, more recently, what we added is definitely a, a uh, it's a more detailed stream on governance and reinforcing the governance, the measurement, and the reporting. Um, we talked about some uh, public disclosure that are now, now I think in, uh, Jason mentioned in uh, in the US uh, that is coming coming also in Europe uh, with what we call the CSR directive uh, uh, coming into play, where people will have to report anyway publicly. Um, and so we we also part of the uh, Climate Neutral Data Center Pact in Europe. We are uh, certified that uh, we have certified our carbon trajectory with SBTI as well. So there's definitely a, a huge um, stream on on uh, this part of, I would say, not governance from a human perspective, but from a data and from a measurement perspective. And frankly, some days I I feel I'm just doing reporting right between our customers, our investors, and our uh, and uh, the the public authority. We are reporting a lot of, uh, of data on, on that. So, uh, but we see uh, this uh, reporting as an opportunity also to, to drive and to, uh, to be more efficient in the day-to-day -day business. So it's not just to report, it's to, uh, to improve, right? So that's how, that's how we, we do it and we will continue to do this, but clearly um, this, uh, this is this, this principle. And we also added a, a stream on, uh, very recently more like local territories and how we contribute to the community and i think that's important back to my first uh, comment on the new context about getting the permit to to grow actually and if you don't address the local communities you're not going to get that permit so doing specific outreach to local communities to explain what is uh, the digital economy i mean pretty basic you know like uh, kids in college uh, they um, they don't always understand that when they play TikTok, there is actually physical infrastructure and a server somewhere, right? It's not in the cloud. It's actually in a very hard, uh, you know, uh, existing facility just around the corner. So when you start like, a, oh, okay. Uh, and that's kind of, uh, it's, I think it's also important to, uh, to build that knowledge and that uh, understanding. Thank you, Francois. And Raymond, your final thoughts on the question? Yeah, so lots of good answers. Uh, Francois has teed me up for a few different things there, so I, I appreciate that. I, I do believe and agree with you that that risks are opportunities. Uh, at EchoSense, we've we've released recently our compliance package for ESG. So obviously, being based in Europe, we have a different response and a different preparedness for this for these directives that are coming online that have teeth and that are financially risks, obviously for the company. So those compliance and reporting, we don't want guys like Francois spending all day making reports, right? We want to be able to streamline that process for him so that he can get back to doing what he does best. Um, so I think compliance and, and reporting are what we are leaning into to support. Obviously, the company itself is founded on getting to net zero. So, you know, we, we're we very in alignment, very much in alignment with this. I look at it financially. Obviously, there'll be penalties. We want to future proof the Americas with what's going on in Europe and prepare us over in the States to be ready when we do have teeth. 
Um, when anything, if something can get through our Congress and it has teeth, we're going to need to be ready for it. And so ultimately, I think that's a, a big risk. The other risks I think are, are coming from a branding perspective as well as a perspective of you know how conscious are you and how aware are you of the community impact right so francois has mentioned earlier what is the community impact and how vested are you in the local community so if you're not branding yourself with being forward thinking uh thinking about the planet and our resources right we've talked about the utility grid and what type of power you're getting how clean is this power how sustainable is this power source so you know all these things are a bit over uh overlap a little bit but they're all risks to our way of life and our professional ways of life right so i think it's important to save the money it's important to be aligned properly with the community and with the future of where we want to go um but ultimately i think the, the the greatest risk is to the fact that you know we only have one planet one home that provides us all of this all of the blessings that we have so ultimately the biggest risk is we are not we're not going to hand over a sustainable healthy planet to our next generation i think you know aligning with that as uh your 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 tent pole that holds up your tent is very very positive way to address this and mitigate your risk and and i think uh financially is the easiest way is to to be compliant gather the data make sure that you're in 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 compliance and that'll be the best way to mitigate it short term excellent raymond thank you very much any other thoughts on this question before we we move on all right, then I am going to move on. Next question, how do you see risk analysis from a sustainability perspective playing out in your conversations with your clients? Let me go ahead and read that one more time. How do you see risk analysis from a sustainability perspective playing out in your conversations with your clients? Um, Pete, let's go ahead and start with you. Yeah, I think, um... I think the whole kind of risk analysis, sustainability discussion is a different discussion that's probably been had before um, across, once again, multiple industries. Um, historically, it can be very transactional um, and just very much a, um, you know, a deal by deal basis. And I think there is a both a, a, the risk side of things and an opportunity also. Um, by having this dialogue with, with organizations and your customers, just clearly shows where you are as an organization. And I think it's uh, you know, been discussed already that you know, sustainability will become a ticket to the game rather than just a unique selling point, but also the risk management of what you're doing and the huge requirement of energy, the right type of energy coming into data centers, how it's sourced and what you're doing, and also looking at various other elements, you know, price volatilities, we talk about security of supply, yeah, there's a lot of work that's being done and requests that we see around adaptation. So actually managing climate change and living with climate change as well. So having those discussions with your customers and saying what you're actually doing and what your forward plans are, are hugely beneficial. And so that's taking those risks and showing that you're actually concentrating on those and turning it into an opportunity because organizations and especially you know, some of the bigger organizations that are taking uh, data and long-term contracts from data centers will want to know that they're with an established business that's got a plan in place so i think by having those discussions and highlighting the risk and how you're managing them could turn into a longer term opportunity uh, amazing answer there uh francois your thought yeah i think i mean uh, i i I'd like to 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 add a, a slightly different approach to this, uh, which is um, risk analysis and time to market. Actually, in the ideal world, if there was no time to market, you would go to the best site with the best grid connection, 100% renewable energy. You would spend a lot of time in designing, uh, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But then you would deliver capacity in 2035. And today, I think uh, what we're seeing the demand. Most of the selection is driven by availability more than actually the perfection of uh, uh, the, the the sustainable side. It's a bit of a, I would prefer not to, but that's a, the real life. And there is a race for data center capacity right now. We, we're seeing that there is a, uh, you know, more demand than real supply, given up. We talked about AI and everything. And so it's a bit of a, it will normalize, obviously, and over the, the course of three to five years, it will be a bit more, uh, I would say, yeah, I try to really optimize the sustainability part. But to, for today, I think I see our client just taking capacity where they can, actually. And it's a bit of a pity, but that's a, the, that's a reality. Um, and and up to us also as operator to uh, 
to catch up real quick on the next generation of, the, of data centers and be able to propose this on uh, real real quick. And I think we are serving like a large corporate and hyperscalers. They all have pretty ambitious uh, sustainability goals. So the risk, I mean, for us, we have to uh, use 100% renewable energy, be efficient on, on the energy, et cetera, et cetera. So that is not even a risk analysis. It's just uh, you're in the game or you're not, right? So from their perspective. Um, and But then with the mitigation of availability, right, and, and time to market. I'm seeing a lot of shaking, uh, a nodding of the the other panelists. Uh, Jason, that includes you. What are, what are your thoughts? Here? Yeah, I mean, it is uh, a little bit of a interesting time right now. Just if you have capacity somewhere, somebody will take it, um, and it, and it probably doesn't matter, which I, I think is a is a bubble a bit. Um, you know, latency is an AI killer at the end of the day. So ultimately, stringing out you know capacity across different regions and and uh, states and and countries you know limits some of the use cases that you can do there. So I think it will eventually come back together. But you know what I'm seeing with with our customers, it really started maybe with with COVID, which was an interesting time of just disruption you know, kind of in our in our industry and in the world, right? So thinking about risk and having more conversations about it. Um, and then you know talking about esg and dei kind of during that time because it was a very sensitive time in terms of just you know people worrying about their families and their health and and then sort of shifting a couple of years forward and talking about sustainability and environmental goals there was a little bit of you know we're going to kind of roll into a, a recession and we're really worried about optimization and we spent a lot of extra money during covid so how do we how do we make sure we balance the cost to you know our sustainability and, and esg goals and then I would say now it's very much the conversation is okay ESG your goals prove it to me that you know you you put your money where your your mouth is and I think that's um, we're seeing that more and more with our customer conversations you know which is why we've you know really focused on our reporting but also you know things like our green bonds that we did you know two years ago I think was the largest you know data center asset backed security deal focused using you know, green bond, um, which, you know, ultimately requires us to, to make sure we're conforming to those requirements. So I think, you know, customers want to make sure that you are, you know, you're able to prove it essentially today, which I think is different from three or four years ago in the conversation. Very good, Jason. Thank you. Raymond, your thoughts? Yeah, yeah. you know, I think um, what's interesting, I'll take a slightly different tack because those are all great answers and uh, I kind of covered it, is I think from the perspective of working with your customer to mitigate risk, you need to be willing to have the uncomfortable conversation. You also need to be willing to help hold their hand through the process of understanding how how do you become more sustainable and, and how does that measure up with your financials and your your vision and your plan for your business? I mean, this is throwing a monkey wrench into a lot of people's goals and ambitions, right? To race out, as they said, find capacity and build and build. If they have to take a step back and look at their business holistically and figure out what do I wanna measure? How am I gonna report it? And what am I going after when it comes to a sustainability perspective? Most clients are uneducated, frankly, at this point. They're used to, you know, day to day doing what they have to do to get the job done. They're not spending all their days becoming experts on sustainability. So our job is to obviously hold their hand through this process and then and be able to ask the tough questions, but also have solutions ready. Right. If I uncover the pain and I put them in a state of, of disrepair and they're a little concerned, I need to have some solutions for them as well that will help them to address this. Uh, but I think that is to me where the rubber meets the road is is having uncomfortable conversations get used you know get comfortable being uncomfortable and helping them to have the tough calls like i want to build i have capacity and i, I you know I, I want to spend this x amount of dollars in this perspective but if i don't tackle and i don't put money towards reporting and i don't put this process together maybe that ends up impacting me in a way that i that i really can't handle in the next you know couple few quarters etc so i just think that is important right making sure that you're able to work through these things hand in hand with your customer. And that's really gonna, I think, build and strengthen your relationship in the long run. And at the end of the day, hopefully get a sustainable metrics and, you know, installed and, and integrated. Thank you, Raymond and Michael. Yeah, number one, completely agree with both Jason and Francois' point uh, on this here. Vacancy rates are, are certainly a challenge, uh, especially when we're representing tenants. Like when, when your options are limited, uh, by what's available on the market. I mean, you can weight sustainability all you want and all of those metrics, but if it comes down to two options, um, there, there's not too much that you're ranking. Uh, and that has led to 
a, a rush to market for operators as well, focusing on what's available now, what can they what can they get to market as quick as possible. And like some of those some of those sites are in are being selected in less than sustainable grids. Uh, but you know what? I mean, there's unprecedented demand right now, and those sites will perform well. Uh, hopefully, there's as many other uh, strategies as they can to increase the efficiency and and re reduce the overall impact. Uh, but I mean, that that's really that's really a challenge that we're seeing right now. And I would just add on to the the, the tenant perspective in in speaking with our clients and really trying to understand like what's driving these decisions to focus on sustainability. One thing that has come up over and over again is it's not just them and your client that you should be focused on. It's your clients, clients and your clients, clients, clients. They all have these goals. They all have these metrics that they're um, that they're pursuing when they're pitching on business. They're including um, ESG and how their organization pairs up with their competitors. Right. So, again, it goes it goes beyond just the pure financials of of the projects and the deals that we're currently working on and goes into, I mean, really the, the overall operation of, of their company. Sometimes it has to do with their financing. Sometimes it has to do with winning new business. Right. But I mean, the more you look at it, there's, there's a significant network effect to these requirements. When one company, um, when one company implements these, these sustainability goals, it can drive many other companies to adopt those same strategies. Excellent, Michael, thank you very much. And gentlemen, I'll bet you didn't know that we've already talked for 42 minutes. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna move through <clears throat> the next two questions a little quicker, uh, but I definitely wanna get to those. <clears throat> Excuse me, and we may end up going a little bit over and that's okay. So next question, when it comes to business case development, how can operators link it back to overall customer need, net zero ambitions and carbon reporting. I'm going to start with Pete on this one. Yeah, I'll be, uh, I'll try to be as brief as possible, but it's a good, good question nonetheless. Um, I think it's, um, it's really about knowing your customer and really understanding what they really require. Um, we've worked with a data center provider who's, who's really trying to link up with their larger customers who are for long-term sustainable sourcing of renewable energy, for example. So it's looking into that. I think there's a lot of talk around um, scope one, scope two, and scope three, and everybody is scope three of somebody at some stage. And so it's making sure you are aligned to, to, to your to your customers, and ultimately that's how that then filters into the business case. But also because ultimately, if you get your business case right and you can show there's a customer demand for it, and a customer requirement for it, and you can identify that and show that. Um, then that should be able to you know, create a really good solid structure to any business case because there's a need. And I think it's aligning to those needs, but understanding and identifying those needs and being able to articulate that. Awesome. Thank you, Pete. Raymond? Yeah. Um, you know, I'm thinking uh, my mind immediately jumped to when you said operations, uh, acceptance of new technology, new directives and new goals and training of those folks on the on the ground level is something I've been focusing on a lot more lately as I find the higher ups and, and the business may make decisions on how to embrace sustainability and ESG, but then getting it to water down to the local level and actually getting those gentlemen to embrace it and to see the value and to do it on a day to day basis, I think is actually an important conversation to have. So. Not exactly answering your question, but I think from an operational level on the on the local level, at the bottom level, we need to spend time educating and empowering those guys because they're the ones that actually have to make the changes in their day to day routines and lives to impact and to integrate these these sustainability metrics. Right. So whether that's running new reports or doing new activities or new methods of procedure, et cetera. So I think that's important to, to get the low level, the, the I wouldn't say low level, but the uh, boots on the ground bought into this and trained up. Very good, Raymond. Thank you, Francois. Yeah, I mean, when you when you look at the data center operators and the way they, they sell to the customer on a large basis, it, it's rental plus energy, right? The rental market, the rental piece is fairly, I would say, consolidated and mature. The energy piece is more interesting because it's always a pass through back to back to the customers. And with what happened in the energy market, especially here in Europe, uh, where conventional energy has gone up to uh, hundreds and hundreds of euro per megawatt hours. It has created a, an interesting dynamic on the energy side because it makes the business case for specific solution for uh, 
on-site energy or renewable energy a lot more interesting to customer actually and so uh where the it didn't used to be such a differentiator it, it it is starting to be and it will be more and more and especially now that also with the grid infrastructure being a bit constrained you're seeing um site with no guarantee of supply 100 percent of the time so what do you do then uh, and then you can start having interesting uh, solution on the energy side so i could uh, spend hours on that but clearly i see the future where we can work a lot on the energy part of the, the equation uh, when I feel like we probably should spend hours on that at some point, uh, but unfortunately, we're going to move along. Michael, your thoughts? Yeah, so I mean, for the business case, sustainability can't you can't stress enough how important it is. Uh, right now, I think there's a little bit more weight that's put on financial decisions because of what's going on in the overall uh, economy. There are challenges there. But at the same time, when operators are implementing business cases now, I mean, you're not you're not talking about the next six months, the next 12 months. You're talking about the next five years. Uh, if you wait for us to get through uh, the current economic term, turmoil, quite frankly, it will be too late uh, to start implementing those strategies. These things take time. There's a lot of capital involved. Uh, so, I mean, those those that will succeed here and, and really start creating some competitive advantages are already working on it. And they've been working on it for years, um, so it's it, it's not so much it, it's not it's not a want it's a need it's a question of how how quickly are you going to lean into um, sustainability as an argument for your business case. Very good. And Jason, to put a button on this question. No, I think ultimately, you know, not having these capabilities as part of the business case really just is a non-starter right so it's it's got to be there otherwise the opportunity cost you're not going to have any customers left right because ultimately i think it will you know re be a requirement but i think to to michael's point as well it's it's um you know the the, the power capabilities and just the demand cycle is in this weird state where you know, right now, if you can go work with a with a uh, local or state government that has you know good power capacity and has a good roadmap, it's just easier to get things done and, and easier to to move faster. And we're starting to see you know a lot of shifting workloads out of traditional tier one locations in the U.S. to you know these tertiary secondary markets that continue to be you know some of the fastest growing markets in the world now. So you know things are definitely changing, but the the focus has to be on these, or you just can't you, you won't be able to compete um, in the market. Excellent, Jason. Thank you very much for that. All right, guys, we're gonna we're gonna jump to the speed dating round of uh, of the uh, of the roundtable today. Um, I'll give you each thirty seconds to answer this question. Let's let's have some fun here. Um, what will sustainability sustainability's role be in the competitive landscape? And so. Um, by by talking about sustainability as a key differentiator, what will sustainability's role be in the competitive landscape? And Jason, we'll just keep kick it back over to you. I mean, you're already seeing it. It's it's the you know what's the magic quadrant now of your sustainability capabilities as a data center operator. So it's already starting to happen, and and you know the transparency is uh, rising for sure, which I think is a great thing to help the competitive dynamics and making sure that we can continue to stay relevant, but also. The competitive dynamics help to make sure that we, you know, continue to, to innovate and stay relevant with our customer base. Awesome, Jason. Thank you, Raymond. Yeah, I mean, I think Jason nailed it on the head here. You can't be competitive um, if you're not already, frankly. And I think Michael hit it on the head. If you haven't been working on this and you're already not actively doing projects and taking steps, you're going to lose uh, out market share pretty quick. So obviously, I think at this stage of the game, you need to be uh, promoting your plans and your visions for how sustainability is going to be integrated and you need to be very transparent about the challenges right and then i think at that at the end of the day it's a lot easier conversation uh when you're promoting where you want to go being transparent about the challenges and then you can have more of a collaborative connection with your customers hopefully aligning with all the the larger um the logos out there that are our clients clients right and what they want excellent thank you raymond michael yeah i mean uh, i reiterate a couple of points I made earlier, the vacancy rate is already higher in, uh, in older facilities that are less efficient. Uh, that will continue to be this, the case. I mean, if we if we see energy costs continue to increase like they have, uh, the benefits of locating it in a more sustainable site uh, will only become more pronounced. Uh, 
So, I mean, so this is a trend. It's it's going to continue, and it's 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 really a need for operators to stay relevant and competitive. Thank you very much, Francois. Yeah, I'll, I'll repeat myself from the, the beginning. I think uh, sustainability uh, is a uh, license to operate and is a license to grow. Uh, I mean, you won't be able to, uh, and I, I'm repeating uh, what you uh, a lot of just said, is uh, it, you're not going to be able to, uh, to expand your business without sustainability, and the bar will be rising. The legislation and the jurisdiction and the customer expectation and the citizen expectation will always continue to rise. Uh, look at the latest uh, German uh, uh, law where you need e reuse, PU, etc. That's just a start. It will get uh, stricter and stricter. And so you better start uh, early and be uh, the first mover. Very good. And Pete, final word. Yeah, I think it's been said. It's a it's a ticket to the game if it's if it's done right. Um, and uh, well, in the future, it will be a, definitely a ticket to the game if it's done right now. It might give you some some advantage. Um, but ultimately, if you're not on top of it and you're not doing it right, and you, you know, the word greenwashing is, has not been used too much, but it, it should be used a lot. You know, if you cut a corner here and there, you will be found out um, because your competitors will be doing a, a better job than you. And then to the point that Francois was saying, you know, regulation will come and get you because you, you get tighter and tighter as the years go on. So, uh, so yeah, you better be doing it right. And it will, uh, because ultimately it will be a, uh, a norm over time. Very good, uh, Pete. Thank you very much. And thank you to all of our speakers for your insights on this very important topic. To those tuning in, if you enjoyed today's roundtable, please keep an eye out for Greener Data Volume 2, Monday, 2024. And in the meantime, visit greenerdata.net for sustainability content and resources. For our next roundtable on December 7th at 1 p.m. Eastern, we will be joined by Telecom Ramblings editor, Rob Powell. We love Rob over here uh, to moderate a panel on the topic, New Year Predictions for Infrastructure and Sustainability. And that, my friends, is a wrap. Look out for the playback of today's roundtable coming soon to JSA TV and JSA Podcasts on YouTube, iTunes, iHeart, Spotify, and more. In the meantime, please join the panelists and I back in the networking lounge and happy networking.